You're listening to The Millionaire's Day Off, where people come to unlock their full potential and start achieving their goals. Now, here's your host, Tyler Kaysen. Hi, everybody. It's Tyler here again with The Millionaire's Day Off. Today, we sit down with John Armijo. Uh, he is a actor, uh, a director. He's done, you know, big blockbuster things like Logan, uh, Terminator, and um, Jurassic World. He also has uh, been in the director's chair for a couple years now, uh, hosting his own shorts of the Flop series um, and all other and a, and, a, and a lot of other short films and indies. So I'm super excited for this conversation with him today. Thank him so much for his time. Uh, just to follow up, we do have these hats for sale on our Facebook page. So if you are interested, you can get that on our Facebook page. Other than that, thank y'all so much for watching, and we'll catch y'all later. Nice. Uh, well, cool, man. So let's talk about our fun productions, man. What's been going on sure. with that? I see, I see Flops 3 is coming out, doing, doing it. What's going on with all that? Uh, Flops 3. Well, um, Flops 3, uh, of course, is the third episode in that series. It's a web series, and uh, we actually started filming it last January. And uh, it was originally going to be one, uh, one story. Um, probably about an hour, hour, 20 minutes long in total. Um, started knocking it out, um, one scene every three weeks or so. And then, um, you know, COVID comes and goes. And then we had a hurricane here in Louisiana and then COVID came back. So uh, rather than delay, um, we're about 45% done with it. But rather than delay, I said, okay, let's, let me try a different approach. Instead of just doing one full length feature, try doing this in chapters. So starting in December, I started releasing them in chapters. So uh, we've got chapter one out, chapter two out, and chapter three will be out in about two weeks. Yeah. And uh, I think that's the way to go. And also because I, I analyzed everything and tried to find out the best way forward for us is, uh, you know, um, younger people aren't necessarily going to sit there and watch something that's an hour and a half long. They will watch something that's 10 minutes long. So I'm trying that approach with this to kind of see how that works out. Yeah, I've, I've learned that lesson the hard way. So like, you, you, know, you can watch the YouTube algorithms. Like, so I've been doing these for a couple months now. And like, after 15 minutes, like, it's like almost like everyone drops off. So yep. it doesn't matter like who I'm interviewing, who I'm talking to, like at that 15 minute mark, usually mm -hmm. it's we're done with this. So that's why I'm trying to like, keep it around that 15 minutes. Cause, cause after that, nobody's watching anymore anyway. Exactly. So yeah, I do the same thing. I just pay attention to the viewership. So, uh, uh, I've also been breaking into snippets because I, 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 like I said, I analyze, try to figure things out. So I've got Facebook, pretty good control on that. Uh, Instagram's all right. Snapchat is pretty useless for what I do. Um, so I broke into TikTok like a month ago and I've been kind of messing with that to try to get a, a good understanding of that. And it, it took off. So we had one clip that went up to two, up to 2.3 million in about a week. So uh, that happened last week. But again, as I'm watching that take off, I, I, I experiment with it. Let me put up some more clips and see if there's some residual and some collateral viewers. And that's definitely taken off as well. So got a pretty good understanding of that now. And uh, that, that clip on um, TikTok um, is about 99.5% solid feedback, which is exactly what I want to extract from that. I want to see, okay, two and a half million people are watching this thing. Yeah. What do they have to say about it? And like I said, 99.5% positive. Uh, 0.25 percent bad, saying you suck. Uh, <laughs> 0.25 percent um, just odd, just odd comments that don't make any sense. But yeah. people taking it way too seriously. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Like <laughs> talk changes about like the thing that you do and like the thing for like to help the help the people that aren't as like you know triple A movie people. Like you think it helps? I mean, surely it helps them tremendously, right? Because it breaks down their content in these little snippets. Well, like I said, I read a lot. I pay attention a lot to trends and, uh, you know, Facebook, for example, uh, doesn't have a lot of young people on it. You know, it's, it's what, 12, 13 years old at this point. It's a lot of old people like me arguing politics at this point. It's just kind of a joke. Um, so the younger generations uh, have the old ADHD going on and they've all migrated to Snapchat and, and TikTok, something that's just quick hit and run uh, entertainment, you know? Yeah. So uh, that's why I, I said, well, I, I've got to figure this out. I've never really messed with it, no interest in it, but uh, let me try to figure out um, what, uh, what m makes it unique. And that's what I've deciphered from it is, okay, I can make some small content, put it on there and use that to draw viewers from there to our YouTube channel or to other, other venues of my choice. Give them a snippet, give them a taste, and there's more, here's where you gotta go to get it. Gotcha. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, so when do you like, so, so when you're doing flops or hopeless or all those like, or hell highs, like when, 
when do you decide it's time to do another project or like, do you take time off in between each one or do you usually just go straight forward to the next thing? Yeah, I'm a workaholic, so I don't stop. <laughs> what does that look um, like with a full-time job? I make it work. Um, my job is not difficult. Yeah. I'm pretty good at it. Even during the pandemic, it's been annoying, but it's never been difficult. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I make time for it and, uh, it's, it's, uh, even though I say I work a lot, um, I, I, if you enjoy what you do, you don't ever really feel like you're working, you right. know? And uh, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so you move just one from one project to another, just trying to, trying to stay busy. So, I mean, it's usually just weekends, I'm assuming like whenever you're off. No, but... no, whenever, well, yeah, whenever necessary, you know, whenever, uh, there's a lot of scheduling. I mean, producing this thing. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's a, that's a job in itself is because there's so many schedules you got to juggle. You know, there's locations you have to juggle wardrobe. You got to secure. Um, I write everything. And then I have a buddy of mine who I've known for about 35 years. He comes in behind me and double checks everything I wrote and, and tells me, this is great. This is awful. Add some ideas. You don't want somebody who blindly agrees with you because then you end up with star Wars episode one. <laughs> yeah. Where they just say, it's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. And it's not, it's awful. So you need somebody to give you some, some feedback. Um, but I, I non I ever since I was a kid I nonstop have you know ideas I used to write comic books and all that so I always had ideas um, bouncing around my head and uh, the way that I write is uh, you know tell me who I have to work with what I have to work with give me five minutes and I'll come up with a synopsis once I have an idea of what we're going to do what I have to work with then I could just sit down and you know 30 60 minutes write a script and uh, seems to work yeah how do you mix like your stuff like the directing and all that to tour your big triple A stuff. Like, do you just kind of like, so do you just like do those when they come in? Like, you know, GI Joe or Jurassic world, do you just kind of do those oh, yeah, yeah. Come in or yeah, those in? as they come in because you, you have lead time on those, you know, I, I get offers and I can accept or I can decline, you know? And, uh, I did those for many, many years. And, uh, I always knew that, uh, I, I don't like to stay stagnant. I always like to do what's next. And you do that for a while. And, uh, whether you're, on, whether you're on a small set with a, you know, thousand dollar budget, low budget anything or on Jurassic World with $300 million. It's pretty much the same process. Once you've seen it a few times, I, I did the math one time and I had like 10,000 hours of onset experience. I said, all right, I, I think I got a pretty good understanding of how this works. And some of my friends that I made along the way, they started branching off and doing indies and they kept saying, you got to come with us, Johnny, you got to come do your own stuff. And uh, so I watched two or three guys doing it. They brought me and I watched them do it and I said, yeah, I can do this. And uh, yeah, uh, I take those offers as they come, do it or don't do it. And then uh, I really, really enjoy doing my own stuff more. And uh, besides having a regular job now, most of my life, half my life have been self-employed. So uh, it's a very natural fit for me. How I, does stuff like that get funded? Like, like flops and all that. Do you just fund that straight out of pocket? All you. <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah. Okay. And I know a lot of people. I know a lot of people. And uh, I got a partner that I do this with, a guy named Michael Anglin. And, uh, we had worked on, you know, movies and TV shows over the years, but we never ever did one. I think we did maybe one scene together over all those years. And, but we used to just sit and talk because there's a lot of waiting around. So we'd always just sit around and talk and we were pretty chummy. But then when I started putting them up together, my own crew, like four or five years ago, um, he jumped in and said, Hey man, can you use some help? And I knew he had directed some indies. So I said, sure, come on, come on in. So he uh, came in and learned a lot from me. I learned a lot from him and, uh, started building our crew, but the two of the two of us got together and, uh, you know, started sharing ideas and we're both, uh, we both know everybody on the golf, on the golf coast, um, film world. So again, it's all who, you know, and locations. And if, uh, if, if I don't have something, I usually get it with a phone call or two and make things happen. Yeah. When does the return of investment come in on something like flops or anything like that? Uh, well, I'll tell you when it happens. <laughs> yeah. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> no. And ult ultimately that's not really even the goal. Yeah, because like I said, I've been self-employed and we're, we're fine in that department and uh, at a different stage of life now where my kids are growing up. Mm -hmm. Now uh, I'm truly, truly just enjoying myself. And this is how I enjoy myself. This is how I unwind and how I relax. And uh, I have a lot of local actors that I market nonstop on like Instagram and Facebook and a lot of casting directors follow me on, on social media and I watched them get tons and tons of work as a result. It's like, okay, there's a sale. Yeah. Now I'm able to help the people around me. Okay. That's awesome, dude. I love it. I mean, yeah. right now you're helping somebody out that you met one time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's right. really, that, that's really, um, um, how I see this is, um, I, I call it very hippie ish. It's because, okay. For, as I said, my, my partner, Michael Langland and I, we'd only worked together one time, but we hung out a lot on movie sets and, uh, it used to annoy me. It's like, why is it up to somebody else? And this is the self-employed guy in me coming out. 
why is it somebody else, up to somebody else when they decide when we work together? You know, uh, there's certain people I want to work with and people I hate working with. I never want to see them again. You know, it's like, I just need to take control and do it my way. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and to get other people in, uh, it sucks because uh, you've met me and I'm, I'm reasonably a nice guy, I believe, but I look really, really mean. So I play a lot of, when I get my roles are usually a mean guy or a cop or a soldier. So I don't ever, ever get a chance to do the stuff I want to do because I'm typecast. And part of the logic is, you know, I write comedy. That's, that's just what I do. But if I stuck to, you know, regular Hollywood studios, it would never happen. I mean, I, I got one comedic role on a TV show called Preacher and it was cut. You know, it's the only comedic role I've ever got. And, uh, and it was cut. But if I want to do things my way, I'm going to have to do it myself. So when I bring local actors in that, you know, I know a lot of them. Um, it's like, what have you never done before? What would you like to do? You know, we have a girl who says, man, I only get, you know, a uh, little like a scared girl or a prostitute or whatever. I really like to do action. You know, so we put her in our hopeless, put her in health size and give her some action roles. And, you know, she was happy to do it because she gets experience. We provide a very, very supportive set of judgment. Everybody take your time. And it's all about all of us evolving together. And I know that sounds very help, uh, hippie-ish, but that really is 100% the goal. <laughs> yeah. So do you like have, so like, do you have someone besides your business partner who you kind of like, who mentors you through all these, like, I'm sure there's so much you've learned in doing hopeless and, and all those movies. Like, is there someone who's like, Hey man, I would do it this way or other than your business partner? Uh, well, like I said, it all begins with writing. You know, I write what I think is funny and I write based on what I know I have access to, like, and I have access to police cars. I own police uniforms. I have all that stuff because you know, it's just built up over time. And I have a pretty good, um, uh, stable of, of locations around here because I know so many people. You know, uh, I tell people that ask me about writing, I say, I would never write a story on an aircraft carrier because I don't have access to an aircraft carrier, you know? Mm-hmm. And people, people try to sell scripts of things that just can't be done. But if you realistically write what you know you have access to, usually for free, you can make things happen. So I start with the writing and then my buddy, as I mentioned, comes in and, and follows up and tells me what's working, what's not working and adds stuff. And then I go to Michael, my partner, and uh, he, he, he's our director of photography, with a lot of director experience also. Then we sit down and then we go through things and he, he starts visualizing, okay, how am I going to technically make this work? You know, so I give him the story and then he deciphers what's in my head to how is that going to look on camera? Every now and then I will say, listen, there's one shot that I just want this one shot to look a specific way. But even that's very, very rare. Usually I just trust him to make it happen because that's not my area of expertise. I understand it but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not my area of expertise at all. Yeah, I got you. So from a, I originally wanted to do this to learn how to direct, and I'm pretty good with people, and uh, I broke it down in, into terms I can understand in my head. So like a producer is like a CEO. They assemble the team. You know, the director is like a manager. He manages the day. Um, then you have department heads and, and employees, I guess you could say. Um, so I originally started wanting to do this to be a director, but then – it became evident pretty quickly that just my own experience, I was a much better producer at making things happen with phone calls and you know, getting people together and arranging it all. And it's only been like the last, I'd say, 18 months where I've actually kind of slid into directing more. What is, um, do you have people on staff for our fun or is it just you and you just kind of. We have a crew. Out? We No, we have a crew. There's that about you- uh, five, five or six of us. Yeah. Okay. That we one know, girl from the video who beats up the, the, the Hispanic boy, man, that girl is good, dude. <laughs> he lit it up. Um, you want, uh, I, I wish you would send me, yeah, I'm going to send her a copy of this, okay, because <laughs> that girl used to work for me in my personal life five years ago. Okay? Yeah. She's not acting. <laughs> yeah, that's who she is. <laughs> and that is the key. And this person... Made, our name is Bailey, used to make me laugh relentlessly. And I'm pretty hard to make laugh. Yeah. I mean, just in stitches every freaking day because she's not acting. It's this little tiny girl and just talks the maddest shit you've ever heard in your life. I mean, <laughs> and it is fucking hilarious. And I said to her, I said, one day, and she went to school with my daughter. You know, they graduated together. And I said, one day, you're not going to work for me anymore. You know, and then I'm going to find a role for you in this because she knew I did this shit. I'm going I'm to find a role for you for sure. So like a year and a half passed after she left. And I wrote uh, in Flops to this waitress role. And I said, I got this script for you. If you want to join, come join. But she, she'd done some uh, theater in high school. But no, never, never, never did any uh, uh, film. So gave it to her. She came and did this diner scene with, you know, four established actors. And absolutely fucking killed it. Absolutely destroyed. 
And after that, I mean, I had never gotten so many compliments on one actor as I got on that. And all these dudes said, "Where'd you, exactly what you just said. Where'd you find that girl? Where'd you find that girl? Fucking awesome. Fucking awesome. Yeah. Even the, the, the extras, the background that were in that diner said, that girl was fucking killing it. And it was great feedback. And uh, so I really originally wanted her for that one scene, but then it's like, my God, you got cold here. <laughs> you know? yeah. And I said, do you have a good time doing that? Yeah, you want to do some more? It's like, all right, we got to get you into the series now. So Flops 3, the scene you just mentioned, was uh, the first one. And uh, my buddy Frank and I wrote that. We were playing GTA. I don't play a lot of GTA. <laughs> and, uh, we were just in there talking one night. I said, all right, we're going to start writing Flops 3. And let's start with Lippy's character's name. And let's just make it get more and more outrageous. You know, if you ever watch anything, you have with any other comedies, we just make every scene usually just gets more and more outrageous as it as progresses. There's one called The Sovereign Citizen, which is very similar. But let's, uh, you know, have this cop go at it with this, this homie and, uh, you know, takes her badge off, takes her radio off, takes her gun off. And uh, yeah, she, they, did, they did a really good job. It took, uh, took the whole day to do that one scene. And uh, the punch told the police department, let us use one of their cars and, uh, the guy playing the, the gangbanger is another local filmmaker that works in, uh, in Mississippi. And uh, I had only met him once before I auditioned for a part in an indie film that he's doing, some Christian uh, film, where uh, I play his father. Because <laughs> we do look, he's, he's got sunglasses and a hat on, but we do look similar. And I'm two years older than him, so I play his father in that. So uh, that's, uh, that's how I met him. And then the, uh, the bigger guy, there's a bigger guy that stands up in that scene. He's a former N uh, NBA player with the Utah Jazz, a guy named Paul Carter. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had did some local films and he was referred and he said, hey, I want to come do something with you guys. And I said, okay. He wasn't originally in the scene. I said, what can I do with this dude? He sends me a picture. It's like, how tall are you? He's like, yeah, I'm like seven, six. Said, All right, cool. <laughs> Again, you tell me what I have to work with and I'll write it into the scene because she's like five, five or five, right. four. It's like, All right, here we go. Boom. Perfect. You know? So we worked that in the scene and uh, it came out really, really good, but she kills it. Yeah, totally kills it. For sure. You have to be like the king of time management when it comes to like your habits and stuff with all the things you have going on. Are you pretty, are you pretty like calendars full 24 seven? Uh, no, no, um, <laughs> no, I definitely uh, manage it. Um, I do stay busy though. Yeah. I mean, the film stuff I definitely do on my own time. Like uh, even before I was talking to you, I was editing some videos and, uh, just secured a location for our next shoot for flops is on um, February 6th. So I secured that location a couple of weeks ago. I, I got to update the casting crew so they know, you know, what time we're starting and everything. But yeah, I just do it on my own time. Obviously, like the day as we go into filming, I need to make sure I'm organized and I have a checklist next to me, make sure I got this, got this, and, you know. But yeah, I'm, I don't run around. I don't like to be too stressed or rushed. Yeah. John, you're almost like what I'm like, it was almost exactly why I started this podcast called the millionaires day off. It's like, what can I do with my time? That's more productive. Right. So like uh -huh. for me, I was watching Netflix, playing video games, all those things. And I was like, there's gotta be a better way to spend my time and look at all the stuff you've created and all the stuff you've done is just such a huge, like almost a boost of like, okay, so this is what it looks like full time, right. Of, of, of yeah. doing a, a full time job plus doing uh -huh. this at a full, uh -huh. at, at a high level. And so uh -huh. I'm super like, it's almost like, <clears throat> I'm just kind of like watching and just be like, okay, so this is how you do that. What advice would you have for someone who's just trying to like keep busy and keep trying to find, drive through that passion? Well, I would say the first step for me is, um, you know, like I mentioned, a lot of my friends had gone into indie stuff and I've watched them and they, they involved me and I said, well, I can do this. And I said, I'm going to write something. So I wrote something that's called um, Director's Cut and it's on IMDb. It's all ready to go. It's done. And I said, okay, this is a really cool project that we can do. And I said, ready to start. And I realized, don't know what I'm doing. It's like, okay, that's the mistake that I'm watching everybody else make is they go from doing nothing trying to do a feature and they fall on their face because they have no idea what they're doing. So I said, okay, don't want to do that because you get one chance. People are going to trust you once, you know, and if you let them down, they're not going to trust you again. So uh, I said, you know, uh, rather than go out and get a camera crew and try to figure it out as I'm going, I already have a film studio in my pocket, my cell phone. So I said, let me, uh, I used to do these little silly skits on Facebook with my son. We call them pop tart adventures. We used to do those just as a joke, but I used to put them on, uh, on Facebook and they always a good response and they'd get like seven to 10,000 hits or views. And I was never really doing it for that. It was really just for fun. And I said, okay, well, I already have an established audience. You know, people are watching these. And I said, so let me just build off that. So I actually sat down and wrote like a five minute script and I have a buddy who looks just like Jason Statham. He's actually a Jason Statham impersonator. <laughs> so I called him. I said, I'm going to write a little script and I want to include a Jason Statham character. Would you do it? Absolutely. So he came down, we sat in a park and we filmed this thing for like eight hours. 
And as we're doing this, all shot on my iPhone, um, I started making notes. Okay, I thought this was going to take two hours. We're seven hours into this. <laughs> you know, start making notes. Where am I screwing up? Yeah. Uh, number two, don't forget to bring water. You know. <laughs> yeah. And then when I get home and start editing, it's like, okay, the sound is garbage. I start making these checklists of everything I'm doing right and everything I'm doing wrong. I'm making notes. Okay, next time when I do something else, I'm going to not make those mistakes. So then a month or so later, we did another one. And then, uh, you know, by the time we got to Hopeless Star Wars Story, that was supposed to be one of these Pop-Tart adventures. And it just got so big uh, because it was only originally supposed to have three characters. And by the time I was done, it was about 150 people working on this because I got the 501st involved because I needed costumes. And that took like six months. And, uh, but that's where I really, really made all my mistakes and learned a lot. Number one, if you can't do CGI yourself, don't do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, just uh, you, you learn by doing. And I'm not afraid to fail. I'm not afraid to make mistakes. And, and that's how you figure it out. So uh, yeah, from there, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm past the iPhone now. Because we had like steady cams for iPhones, you know, microphones for iPhones and all that. And it's like, okay, now we're just going with, uh, you know, real cinematic film cameras because we built up to that level. And then from there on, the, the idea was to, uh, you know, every project to be just a little bit better, a little bit better. As I said, learn what we were doing right, what we were doing wrong. Now, Michael Englund, who I'm working with, I mean, I'm just watching his evolution. He's a, he's a good actor. I, you know, you see him on TV and stuff, but uh, he's, he's, we're kind of over in front of, let's go behind the camera now. But even watching his evolution is every single scene that we film, I'm watching it's just evolution just get better and better and better. And you, you learn by doing you know, that's how I learned anyway. You could throw me in a classroom, but I don't want to be there, number one. But I learned by doing. Yeah. So that's what I would say to anybody. Is start small with your iPhone. You make all your mistakes before you put an ounce of money into it. Make your mistakes. And, yes. and you do that for a year or two. And people aren't patient. They don't want to wait. They want to jump in and say, no, no, I know how to do this. No, you don't. Because <laughs> I've watched well-known directors. You know, I work with a lot of big movies. Watch these guys work. And I don't know what they know, you know. And uh, they made all their mistakes the same way. So I, I think that's the key is start small, take your time. And I, as far as indies, I think I'm going on five years this summer. will be five years. Take your time. Take your time and start small. And then, funny enough, um, uh, one quick story is uh, flops. We, we did the first flops two years ago. And uh, I was bored one day. I, I wrote this uh, five-minute script and uh, called a couple guys together and uh, – I think it took us five hours to shoot the first one. And we had a guy that works with us a lot named John Mangus. He was supposed to be the lead role in that. I said, you know, we got cop outfits. Let me just write something. I'll make a cop's parody. And the night before we were going to shoot, he called me and he said, hey, dude, I don't think I'm able to make it. I'm really not feeling well. Now I know it was, now we know it was COVID that he had. Right. You know? So then COVID hit like a month later. It's like, all right, everything got shut down. And then, uh, it's like, all right, so we're going to have to work around this. So we didn't shoot anything for like six months as the you know, pandemic started off and everybody kind of reestablished their lives. But then the key also is to be flexible. So in the flops too, we specifically wrote small scenes that wouldn't require a lot of people to be around. Gotcha. And have kept it that way ever since. Yeah. Genius. It's like, on, yeah, you, you got you to gotta adapt to the environment and what's going on. Because like on, on, when we filmed Hopeless, the Star Wars story, I mean, there were days where you'd have 50, 60 people on sex, stormtroopers and shit like that. And, yeah. You know, that ain't happening anymore. No, <laughs> no, definitely not. Even on big TV, there's not like, I feel like there's more, never more than like two or three people in a scene at a time. So that's like, yep. that's an industry around. Yep. Just got to adapt. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you just get creative and uh, you, you do what you got to do. Awesome, man. Well, I got one more question for you. Sure. Um, I'll let you get to your busy day of, of editing and all that fun stuff. Um, between like flops and hopeless and hell heist, which has been the the biggest, I guess you've already mentioned that, that you learned all your mistakes from, from hopeless. What, what are the biggest ones you've taken away from flops and from hell heist? Hell heist. We've only done a sizzle reel for a proof of concept. Um, two, two of our uh, actors uh, sadly died since we did that sizzle reel. So that kind of got put on hold yeah. um, while well, we decided what to do with it. And uh, I'm sorry, but the question was, what have I learned on those other ones? <laughs> yeah. So what's the biggest thing you've learned from Flop? I mean, all the COVID protocols or. Yeah, definitely. But again, I go into every single day with an open mind, you know, and every day I walk away and ask myself what went right, what went wrong, what can I do better last next time? Yeah. And uh, whether it's, you know, Hey, um, we could see a microphone peeking out or, you know, uh, we should have got more shots here or, you know, there's always, always, always something to learn. Never assume you know it all. Never. It's the biggest mistake assuming you know it all. And uh, everybody has something to teach you. 
you know, so uh, sometimes we'll have an actor I've never met before that's come on. I'll learn something from them and uh, just uh, be extremely open-minded and flexible and, uh, and always, always um, be open to your own mistakes. It's the only way we're going to learn. There you go. Awesome, John. Well, thank you so much for your time, brother. I really appreciate it.